this afternoon we'll find our text from God's Word as we confess it and as the church has summarized it in Lord's Day 18 where we deal with the ascension of our Lord Jesus into uh, heaven. Find that on page 532 of your book of praise if you'd like to follow along. And there uh, we confess the following concerning the ascension of our Lord Jesus. What do you confess when you say he ascended into heaven? The Christ before the eyes of his disciples was taken up from the earth into heaven and that he is there for our benefit until he comes again and to judge the living and the dead. Is Christ then not with us until the end of the world as he has promised us? The Christ is true man and true God. With respect to his human nature, he is no longer on earth. But with respect to his divinity, majesty, grace, and spirit, he is never absent from us. But are the two natures in Christ not separated from each other if his human nature is not present wherever his divinity is? Not at all. For his divinity has no limits and is present everywhere. And so it must follow that his divinity is indeed beyond the human nature which he has taken on and nevertheless is within this human nature and remains personally united with it. How does Christ's ascension into heaven benefit us? First, he is our advocate in heaven before his Father. Second, we have our flesh in heaven as a sure pledge that he, our head, will also take us, his members, up to himself. Third, he sends us his spirit as a counter pledge by whose power we seek the things that are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God and not the things that are on earth. <clears throat> Congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, next week Sunday, Lord willing, we will commemorate the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. The resurrection of the Lord Jesus from the dead is the joyous news that restores hope and that brings joy into the hearts of all believers. Because the reality in this world in which we're living is that death is constantly around us. And death in this world also brings despair to the heart of all of mankind. When there's death, death speaks about the end of everything. Death reminds us of the futility of our human life. And so suddenly, when you read the gospel, suddenly in the midst of the dark history of this world where there is death all around us, there is this bright moment when we hear about the Lord Jesus who not only dies, but he also rises up from the dead. His resurrection chases away human despair. And it speaks to us again about, about the possibility of eternal life. His resurrection means that the Christian church can again proclaim a message of great joy. Christ's resurrection opens up all kinds of new possibilities for life, for salvation, for a glorious future. And therefore, the Lord Jesus himself told his, his own disciples at a certain point that he would not remain here on this earth after he rose up from the dead, but that he would need to go, he said, to his Father in heaven. He says, I will ascend into heaven, and there I will go to prepare a place for you there in my Father's house. And so as we look at the, the ascension this afternoon, the great comfort of Christ, is that we have our Lord Jesus in heaven, that there he is preparing for us a glorious future in the house of his Father. And therefore, it is by faith that we now are also able to, to look forward to the future with great confidence. The Lord gives to us this wonderful comfort that he is indeed preparing for each one of his people and therefore also for each one of us a place in the everlasting kingdom of heaven. And therefore we may turn to him, we look and we seek from him the life everlasting. 
And so this afternoon we'll confess God's word under this theme. Uh, the comfort, our theme is the comfort of Christ's ascension. So we look at the comfort of Christ's ascension. Under that theme we'll look at three things. First of all, we'll see that we're comforted knowing Christ is the bridge between heaven and earth. And secondly, that Christ takes us up to himself in heaven. And thirdly, that Christ will direct us and direct our lives by the power of his Holy Spirit. Now, when we think about, about the idea of the ascension up into heaven, it's not just something that we all of a sudden come across in the New Testament, in the book of Acts, when, when we read the Lord Jesus went up into heaven, but it's a, it's a theme that you find already from the very beginning of the Scriptures, from the very beginning of the Bible. Mankind already, after the fall into sin, with Adam and Eve, already had a desire there in their heart that they might ascend up into heaven, that they might see God again. And that becomes clear when already in the very early history of mankind, in the book of Genesis, remember uh, we come across a man by the name of Enoch. We dealt with him in that series of sermons we're doing on Hebrews chapter 11. Enoch, we're told, did not die. But he went to be with God in heaven. There is already the reality that our understanding in the very beginning of, of, of this history of the world that mankind would one day go to be with the Lord God in heaven. And so already from the beginning, there was already within the heart of mankind a desire uh, that we might go up and we might be with the Lord God in heaven. Well, you read about such a desire in the, in the hearts of people in Genesis chapter 11 but not in a very positive context. Remember chapter 11 of Genesis is the story about the people building the Tower of Babel. And people in those days, they said to one another, we were told, let us build a tower, a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we can make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we're going to be scattered all over the face of the whole earth. And so we're told that the people then wanted to build a tower. Not just any ordinary little tower, but a tower that reaches into the heavens. See, we need to understand that these people are not just thinking about a, a, you know, a, a skyscraper in, in, into the sky uh, that people might be able to look to as, you know, just like a lighthouse. It might be a beacon that you might constantly look to for your bearings and for your direction. No, they're thinking here about building a tower that reaches into the heavenly dwelling place of God. So read the story. It reminds me of one of the, the first Russian cosmonauts, one of the first men who flew up into, into space. And he came back from that flight into space, and he said, I was up there, but I didn't see God up there. The thought is, if there is a God, uh, then you should be able to see him if you fly high enough up into space. Well, the thinking of that Russian cosmonaut was no different than the thinking of the people back in the days who were building the Tower of Babel. They thought uh, by building a tower into heaven, uh, they could make a name for themselves. They believed that they could storm the gates of heaven. And so they could breach the divide that was there between heaven and and earth. Well, there was some great arrogance in their thinking. Something not so surprising for fallen human, human beings. Arrogance and pride is what lives in the hearts of all of us. And so that arrogance and pride also in their heart back then was they thought, you know what, we have the ability to be able to bridge for ourselves uh, that divide with heaven. And they were told that God notices that people are doing something here on this earth. And you will also hear the irony uh, in that story when, when, you, when God uh, says uh, to himself within the triune God, he says, let us go down and see what they're doing. Oh, think about it. These people, they're, they're thinking they're building something great. They're building this massive tower. And God, who is able, we know, to see all things, mocks them when he says, hmm, let me see. Let, let's go down. I wonder what they're doing down there. Let me go and see what they're, what, they're, what they're doing because whatever it is is so puny, I can hardly see it. But at the same time, God, when he sees what they're doing, understands the danger 
for the people. For he says in verse 6, if they uh, have begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. So what, what the Lord is saying is that if, if the people there building the tower, if, if they can fulfill their plan to build what they want to build, in a sense, in essence, what they're going to start to think about themselves is that we're God. And that we have the power to do whatever we want. And so the Lord God comes, and what does he do? Well, he shatters their arrogance and their pride by confusing their language so that they can't work together anymore. And God reminds the whole human race that they are nothing compared to his greatness. There is no human being who is able to bridge the divide between heaven and earth. Even mankind today, building his spaceships, cannot reach there into heaven. And so the reality is that mankind throughout its history has tried to break through the barrier of heaven. They've tried that the Tower of Babel by building a great tower. They've tried that with uh, the spaceships more recently in recent history. People have also tried that uh, through the way of philosophy. Right? Philosophers throughout the ages have tried to, to use human logic in order to try to establish that connection with heaven above. And they think that through the power of human reasonings that somehow they can find that point of contact with God that lies outside of the Word of God. And so perhaps some of you who may have taken philosophy maybe in high school or university, first years of university, you may be familiar with arguments such as the argument of the first mover. There must be a first mover, mover so there must be a God. Or the argument uh, uh, that morality can only be explained if there is also a, a, a first moral human, uh, there's a first moral being out there. There's a couple of many, many different f uh, philosophical ways in which people have tried to argue for the fact that there is a God in, in heaven. And so they try through these human ar arguments to, to prove the existence of God. They tried to bridge, you can say, the divide between heaven and earth on their own terms. By that we mean this, is they think they can do that by their own human, language, by their own, by their own human logic. But they reject God's own word. They reject the scriptures. As if somehow their own human logic is more important and more powerful. Well, beloved, it was about three generations after the tower, the building of the Tower of Babel. That, children, you might remember the story about Jacob at Bethel when he went to sleep, put his head on a rock, remember, as a pillow. And he, and he received a dream. Remember what he saw in his dream? He saw a stairway or a ladder resting on the one side. It was resting here on this earth, and its top was reaching there into heaven. And Jacob, in that dream, he saw the angels ascending and descending on that stairway. And then Jacob woke up. And when he woke up, Jacob remembered the dream. And he says, how awesome is this place? This is the gate. This is the gate of heaven. You see, what God was doing when he gives Jacob this dream is God says, Jacob, I will bridge the divide between heaven and earth. See, this is not a stairway. This is not a, a tower that, God, that human beings have built. This is a tower or stairway that, that the Lord God makes and that his angels are ascending and descending upon. And it is, in this dream, God reveals that it is not human beings, it's not mankind, but that he, the Lord God, is the one who will bridge the divide between heaven and earth. And that becomes very concrete when God himself comes to the people of Israel uh, when he meets with them at Mount Sinai. In Exodus chapter 19, uh, there the Lord God uh, commands Moses to ascend up onto Mount Sinai, and God says, and there I will come and I will meet you, Moses. At Mount Sinai, God, you can say, bridges the gap by coming down to Israel on the mountain. And Moses, as the mediator of Israel, is to ascend up on the mountain to meet God there. 
And there on the mountain, we read that the Lord God enters into a covenant with his people Israel. In that covenant, he promises his people. He says, I will be the Lord your God, and, and you will be my people. Suddenly, you have that bridge between heaven and earth being consummated there on Mount Sinai. And from then on, from that point on, the Lord God says, I will make my dwelling place in the midst of my people, is my people Israel. And he did that in the wilderness of there when he had to make the tabernacle, the tent, uh, where God would dwell among his people as they're traveling through the wilderness to the way, on the way to the promised land. And later when they get into the promised land, uh, then the Lord God says, I will make my home there in the temple in Jerusalem. And so there God dwells in the midst of his people. And they may, you may remember that in the book of Psalms, there are a number of Psalms. Psalm 120 through Psalm 134, which are often referred to as the songs of ascents. Ascents mean the songs of going up. And with these psalms, the people of Israel would, would sing. And whenever they would make a pilgrimage to Jerusalem and go to the temple of God, they would sing these songs because they would think of themselves as going up, as ascending up uh, to the temple of God. And so this language of ascension was a constant reminder that the people of Israel enjoyed this relationship with the Lord God in heaven. God first came down to his people so that now they can go up to him in the temple and there they can worship the Almighty. And so we find the language of ascension already then found long ago right from the very beginning in the Bible. But the language of ascension in the Old Testament, when we come to the New Testament, we read, is fulfilled in the life of the Lord Jesus. And so remember we read the passage from John chapter 1. There Jesus makes an allusion back to Jacob's dream. He makes that allusion when he is speaking to Nathaniel in John 1 verse 51. He says uh, to Nathaniel, he says, You, Nathaniel, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Of course, Lord Jesus is referring to himself here as the Son of Man. And so Jesus is saying to Nathaniel, he says, I'm the one who will bridge the divide between heaven and earth. And so in the Lord Jesus, the, who is the only Son of God, God himself, beloved, has come down into this world. And the angels who ascend and descend on him, as Jesus says to Nathaniel, are a sign. Those angels are a sign that Jesus is the one through whom we now have contact and we have a restored relationship with God in heaven. Jesus Christ has become the gate that Jacob spoke about through which, beloved, we can now enter into heaven above. You know, it's a, a few chapters after John 1 and chapter 3, Jesus speaks to Nicodemus who comes to him. And when we think of chapter 3 of John, we often are focused on the fact that Jesus says, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. But then the Lord Jesus goes on in verse 12. And there he says to Nicodemus, he says, I have spoken to you of earthly things, and you do not believe. But how will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? And then immediately goes on in verse 13, and he says this, No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven the Son of Man. So what's Jesus saying? Jesus says that because he is the one who has descended down from heaven, therefore he is also able to speak to them about heavenly things that they don't know anything about. Jesus can teach us things, he says, that are only known there in heaven that we do not know here on this earth. Jesus says, that's why I came down to this world, that I might reveal the things that my Father there in heaven. He says, I am the one who alone is able to bridge the gulf between heaven and earth. And then he goes on in verse 14. 
And he says this in John 3. He says, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, referring here, lifted up on the cross, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. So Jesus says that the one who comes from heaven, referring to himself, must be lifted up on the cross so that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. And so Jesus, in a sense, in, in essence, is saying this, beloved. He says, I am the gateway into heaven for everyone who believes in me. Well, the question arises, so how can the Lord Jesus, how can he be our gateway into heaven? Well, that's because the one who has descended from heaven is also the one who can again ascend into uh, heaven. And so when we understand what's going on through scriptures and also what's happening here in the life of the Lord Jesus, beloved, what a comfort the Lord gives us. Because I know that on account of my sins, on account of that rebellious attitude that lives in my heart, against the Lord God, I cannot ascend into heaven. My sin has, has broken the connection with heaven. And that means that I am completely powerless to, to storm the gates of heaven and to enter into heaven by force. I can't do that. Yet the Lord Jesus, who descended from heaven, says, I have come that I may open the way for you into heaven, and I may open the way for you into the eternal dwelling place of God. And so Christ's ascension into heaven with his human body, beloved, is a clear sign that that breach between heaven and earth has been broken, that was broken by sin, has now been restored by Christ. Hebrews 4, 14 it says that Jesus Christ ascended into heaven as our great high priest. It goes on that he has taken our flesh and our blood, gone through the heavens. The flesh and blood that he has offered for us on the cross, he takes that into heaven where his Father is. And there in heaven, the Lord Jesus has now been granted the right hand of his Father where he rules over all things and where he is now our great advocate before the Father. And so the letter to the Hebrews encourages us to, to hold firmly on to our faith, the faith that we profess, he says, in Jesus Christ as our high priest. He goes on in chapter 7, verse 27 of Hebrews, saying that there in heaven the Lord Jesus always, always lives to intercede for us. See what he says, the author to the Hebrews? He says, our comfort is that we now have a high priest in heaven, one who, who never forgets about us. He is constantly busy interceding for us with the Father, always pleading for our life, pleading for our salvation. That also means that when we now today, beloved, turn to our Lord Jesus in humble repentance, we turn our heart to our Savior. We truly grieve for the sins that we've committed against Him and against the Lord our God. That the Lord, in His mercy, will now graciously cover all my sins with His shed blood. What a comfort our ascend the Lord then also gives to us. I know I'm a sinner. I understand also from the law that I'm worthy of God's everlasting condemnation. And yet my Lord comes to me in his gospel and he assures me, assures me that he will intercede for me with his Father there in heaven. And therefore, beloved, look up to the Lord Jesus Christ in faith. Always seek him for your salvation. Know that he will also listen to you when you cry to him and you seek from him life and you seek from him forgiveness. Because you may be fully assured that the divide between heaven and earth has been breached by your Lord and that your relationship with the Lord God has been fully restored. Not because of anything that we have done, 
because of what my Lord and my Savior is Christ, what he's done for me, what he's done for you. Catechism says that there's also a second benefit for Christ's ascension. The second benefit is that we now have our flesh as a sure pledge that he, Christ our head, will also take us, his members, up to himself. You see, beloved, the Lord Jesus does not just restore the contact that we have between heaven and earth. You can even say that he brings heaven and earth together again. That's why we confess that when we die, that we will go to heaven and there we will be with the Lord in glory. But that still begs the question, how can I be certain? How can I be certain that when I die, that I will go to be with the Lord? That I will go to be with him in heaven? And the scriptures tell us this. We can be assured of that because we have our flesh in heaven. Jesus Christ has entered into heaven with our human body. We deal with that in question and answers 47 and 48. And these questions actually have as a background a controversy that took place in the time of the Reformation between the, the Reformed and the Lutherans about uh, understanding what happened to the body of the Lord Jesus the body that ascended up into heaven. See, the Lutherans, uh, they uh, said that the resurrected body of Christ became omnipresent. That means the body, the human body, could be present anywhere in the whole world at the same time. But they were, the men of the Reformation, or the Reformed men, they, they objected to this because they said, well, if that's the case, that means that that human body that Jesus has in heaven is no longer a human body means that the human body has now taken on divine qualities and that it has taken on godly qualities. A human body is a body that can only be in one place at the, the same time. That's how Christ, or that's how God has made us. It's not that God couldn't have made us differently, but that's how he has made us as human beings. Our human flesh cannot be anywhere else at the same time. That's simply the reality of how God has made us. Well, when the body of the Lord Jesus was raised up from the dead, what we do confess is that he was raised with a glorified body. That means that the resurrection body of the Lord Jesus now was a perfect body, a body that became immortal and perishable, a body that would never ever die again, be subject to death. The resurrection body of Christ will live for eternity. And we know that Jesus indeed was raised with a real human body, even though we call it a glorified body, yet it was still a real human body. The Lord Jesus made sure that, that his disciples understood that too. And when he came to them, and, and, and he also had them uh, touch his, his hands and touch his feet to where the scars were from, from the nails. And on a number of occasions, the Lord Jesus, he also uh, ate together with his disciples so that as they ate food, he also ate food as one would with a real human body. And so when the Lord Jesus now ascended into heaven, he was making it very clear to his disciples, and so he makes it clear to us today as well that indeed his body would no longer appear here on this earth, but his body would be there in heaven. And therefore, we confess that Christ's body is always there in heaven. But that with regard to his divinity, I mean, namely to the fact that the aspect of him that he's God, that his divinity has no limits, and it is present everywhere. And so you see that Christ in his divine nature is always, pre is always present with his human nature in heaven. But his divine nature is not just limited to, to where his, his human nature is, but his divine nature can be present wherever he desires to be in the universe. And so why is that important for us? Well, it's important that we understand that because our comfort is that, that the body the Lord Jesus took up into heaven is the same body as we have. That means that in his human body, he is one with us. 
If Jesus is in heaven with our body, it means that he can never ever forget about us when he is there in heaven. Christ's human body in heaven is a guarantee that he will indeed, that, and indeed that we are one with our Lord Jesus Christ, that he is one with us. He is, you can say, a brother of ours, and that we are his brothers, his sisters here on this earth, the same flesh and the same blood. And we understand that that also gives his promise to the disciples in John 14 a greater impact. Because he says in John 14, verse 1 and 2, he says, Do not let your hearts be troubled. My Father's house has many rooms. I'm going there to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me where you will also be where I am. And so there in John 14, he's speaking about his ascension into, into heaven. And he says, when I'm finished my work here on this earth to his disciples, when I'm finished giving my, my life as a ransom for the sins of many, then I will ascend to my Father in heaven. And what's he doing here in John 14 is that the Lord Jesus wants to comfort his disciples. He knows they need comfort at this time. Because the Lord Jesus knows and disciples don't know that yet, but he knows that he's going to depart from this world and that departure is going to be hard and it will be so difficult for his disciples. They will feel as, he, as if he has left them all alone here on this earth. And so he comforts them. He says to his disciples, he says, when I depart, I will go to my father. And in my father's house are many rooms. And I go to prepare a place there for you. And so with those words, he assures his disciples, I'm not going to forget about you. You can be sure. Take my body. I will take my human body into heaven as a sure pledge that I will come back so that I will take you to be with me. And he expresses the whole motivation that lives there in his heart with these words when he says to them in John 14, I will do this so that you may be where I am. That you may be where I am. It speaks about what the desire that lives in the heart of our Lord Jesus. He wants, he says, I want to be with you and I want you to be with me in heaven and so he says that his ascension is necessary in order that he might prepare for that day when there will be that reunion and so he enters into heaven as our brother he goes there with our flesh and our blood he says that I may prepare that wonderful day when you you may live with me in eternal fellowship and communion and beloved, as, as you reflect upon that, isn't that what is our greatest comfort? And isn't that what the desire that lives there in your heart? That we want to be with our Lord. That we want to live with Him in eternity. Because we know that with Him, our life is secure forever. Yes, we have a Savior in heaven. One who is one with us in his flesh and his blood. I have a Savior whose, whose greatest desire is that he may be where I am. And that we may live together forever. That's the whole aim. That's the goal that our Lord Jesus has. That he may be with us. And he may grant us eternal life and salvation. Now, in order to, to achieve that goal, in which he directs our whole life to himself there in heaven, what he says to his disciples in John 14 is, I will send you the Holy Spirit. The catechism says this. It says, he sends us his spirit as a counter pledge, by whose power we seek the things that are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God, and not the things that are on earth. So you see that after the Lord Jesus tells his disciples that he's going to go to the Father in John 14, beginning of John 14, then he promises them that he will give to them another comforter, 
that he might be with them forever, the one who is the spirit of truth. And then he says in verse 17 of this chapter, he says, the world cannot accept him because it neither sees him or knows him. So you see with those words, uh, the Lord Jesus reveals how important the work of the Holy Spirit is for our hearts and for our lives. Because here on this earth, he says, no one can see heaven, and therefore no one knows what is to be found there in heaven. And one of the reasons that mankind rejects God and refuses to accept that heaven is indeed God's dwelling place is because mankind is blind and is unable to see it. Indeed, how can anyone see God? But their eyes are darkened by unbelief. And we know that the eyes of all of mankind are darkened by the corruption of their very hearts. And therefore, the very concept of God dwelling there in heaven is strange, completely foreign to mankind, because mankind can't see it. The heart is blind to that very knowledge. There is this great divide that we talked about earlier between heaven and earth that people cannot bridge because they're blind to what's there in heaven. And because they cannot see heaven and cannot see what is in heaven, therefore they refuse to believe that God dwells there in heaven. But the Lord Jesus understands. He knows the spiritual weakness of his disciples. And beloved, he knows the spiritual weakness also in, in your and my hearts. He understands that from our sinful human perspective, we are not able to see heaven with our own eyes. They're blind. And that's why earthly people so easily get caught up with earthly things, so that we forget about the heavenly reality. Right? Because from our human perspective, that which we see directly in front of our eyes, are the very things that we're always busy with in our daily life. It is, those are the things that are the most important in our life. That means that my entire attention can be consumed by daily work because that is what I'm focused on. I can become totally anxious about paying my bills because I see those bills staring me every time I look at that pile of bills on the table. Eyes can be busy looking at my health because I have troubles and all my time is consumed dealing with my health issues. Or in front of me there are the troubles in my life, perhaps troubles in my relationship that I have with, with other people, maybe troubles with relationships with those who are very dear and very close to me, and that consumes everything in my life. All those earthly cares and concerns quickly block out the heavenly perspective. That heavenly perspective can seem to be so unimportant because it's so far away. It can seem to be so unreal because I'm busy dealing with the things that lie there directly in front of my eyes here on this earth. And the result? is that we quickly forget about the Lord Jesus. We forget how important his work for us was there on the cross. We quickly, we lose sight of, of, of the Lord who is seated there at the right hand of God the Father in heaven, forgetting that he is indeed the one who, who has bought me, forgetting that he's the one who cares for me, the one who promises that he will protect me. Right? Christ's work in heaven can seem to be of little relevance for the things that we're dealing with in our daily lives. You remember, the Lord has once told a parable about the sower. Remember the sower who went out to sow the seed in the different, on, the, on the land, and the seed landed all different kinds of soil. And Jesus says that the reason that many of the seed quickly died after they first jumped up and the seed, remember, represents the gospel that's being sown into the hearts of people in this world. And the reason that so much of that seed quickly withered and perished is because, he says, of the cares and because of the concerns of life. So the cares and the concerns of life quickly extinguished in the hearts of the people in whom the seed of the gospel was being planted or sown. 
For that reason, beloved, our Lord Jesus Christ sends his Holy Spirit so that the Spirit who in our hearts also helps us to never, ever lose sight of the heavenly reality. You see, it is the Holy Spirit who constantly directs our hearts and directs our minds to the things that are above, where Jesus Christ, our Savior, is. And so in the midst of the daily struggles of life, in the midst of the daily cares and the anxieties that you experience, beloved, understand full well that your greatest need are, are not earthly things. No, your greatest need is the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Because the things of this life, they will all pass away. They're fleeting. Our wealth, our money, even our reputation in this world, our friends, our health, even our physical life are all fleeting. But the life that the Lord Jesus has obtained for you, beloved, it is everlasting. And for that reason, the Lord Jesus says to his disciples, I will send you my Holy Spirit so that by the power of the Spirit, you may always focus on the things that are above. It's there in heaven. There we see our Lord Jesus Christ. There he is preparing for us a place in his Father's house where he says there are many rooms through his Spirit. Beloved, Christ comes and he comforts you and I. And he reminds us. He reminds us. He says, you may be sure that you will never be alone. But that I am there above you in heaven. And from there, I am directing everything in your life. I'm directing it to that glorious end when you will be together with me in eternal glory. Amen.